Um, so uh, our next speaker is Professor Matthias Began. So he's a professor of computational neuroscience at University of Tübingen and the chair of Bursting Center for Computational Neuroscience Tübingen. His research lies at the interface between artificial intelligence and neuroscience and focuses on uncovering the representations, algorithms, and neural computational design principles for perceiving neural networks both in the brain and the machines. His talk's title is uh, Testing Generalization. So let's um, welcome the next speaker. Um, hi, I think uh, uh, you, um, you are unmuting yourself. You, you are unmuting yourself. Could you unmute yourself? Um. Okay. Hello. Can uh, yeah, we, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, great. Okay. And you can still see my slides. Uh, no, you are not Australian mm -hmm. now. Okay, good. Then let's turn again. All right. Sorry for that. Thanks for setting up this nice workshop and for inviting me. So I think uh, adversary examples are great examples for differences between uh, humans and machines. And my background is half computational neuroscience and half machine learning. And we, oops, what's that? Okay. And um, so I think of brains as decision-making machines. And ideally, so our life is full of decisions and we make decisions in the past. We observe data in the past and we generalize from this for the future and learn. And my, my dream obviously is the question, can we build artificial decision-making machines similar to the brain? And uh, the, in order to make good decisions, we, uh, the, the key feature is to generalize well from past experience. And in, uh, for generalization, uh, an informal definition of this is like the ability to handle situations or tasks that differ from previously encountered situations. And so, as I mentioned, adversary examples can be seen also as testing generalization, so with small targeted perturbations. And here's an example. So for instance, if we have a photo and we uh, want to make for humans uh, this to look more like a pig, uh, you can, well, some pe people do this by adding certain features. And uh, here you can see that basically human generalization is based on parts and attributes that um, together compose to the meaning of, of the entire image. For machines, this is a bit different. So if you have a neural network, uh, uh, the same image can be with basically imperceptual perturbations turned into a pig, frog, ostrich, or whatever you want. And so these um, type of uh, changes exhibit a very different way of how machines generalize and what the invariances of the machine, machines are. So how can we teach machines to do what we actually want to want them to do? And uh, so the standard setting in machine learning is that we have a training and a test set and that we assume um, that the distributions during training and testing are the same. And basically cross-validation is the main feature by which we constrain the solutions to avoid overfitting what Alexander Matri was already mentioning in his talk. And uh, with this technique, if we have a lot of data, we have seen really great progress on the ImageNet benchmark to become better and better on object recognition. And um, in addition to that, what made me very excited in the beginning about um, the progress of deep learning is that not only these, uh, we, we make progress on this particular benchmark, but it was also possible to use the features learned on the ImageNet benchmark for, for other tasks. Uh, and so one didn't have to start from scratch again for solving other vision problems, but um, the, the features were quite useful for all kinds of tasks, suggesting that uh, this learning 
of ImageNet features has captured something about the visual world that is generally useful. And uh, as an example for this property, I took um, the work from uh, Krieges Cortes lab originally, and uh, no, sorry, uh, from um, De, De Carlos lab originally, where they showed the correlation between um, the uh, uh, ImageNet performance and predicting neural performance. And uh, nowadays, uh, there's a whole brain score benchmark where uh, people try to predict neural, uh, neural responses in the brain. And uh, as you can see in the plot in the middle, there's a correlation. The better the neural networks perform on ImageNet, they tend to be better on these predicting neural responses in the brain. And uh, so the transfer learning setting basically is that you first train the neural network um, to learn these features. And then you, in the extreme case, you just use the features as are, and uh, you, you train a new readout in your head to read out and on a new task for, with new data. And this works surprisingly well. So when you, we did this ourselves on saliency modeling, so on the MIT benchmark, where many, many people have been trying to predict where people look. So for each image, you have uh, recorded fixations. And uh, the task is to predict the density of these fixations as a function of the image content. And as you can see here, the uh, densities depend quite strongly on the image content. And by um, using this tr transfer learning tricks, uh, you can actually, well, it was possible to boost the performance on this task uh, quite dramatically. So the, the y-axis is measuring information gain in bits. So basically how much information is shared about the uh, location where people look. And um, on the right-hand side is the gold standard and the performance increase, for instance, between AlexNet and VGG19 in the beginning, directly transferred also into a performance gain in uh, saliency prediction. And uh, this could be used, for instance, for better image cropping. Another example is um, for marker-free um, key point estimation. It's very desirable that you only have to um, uh, label a few frames in order to be able to extract the key points or track the key points in, in arbitrary movies. And um, so also there, the, using pre-trained networks like image, uh, pre-trained on ImageNet uh, makes it sufficient that you only need 100 frames in order to uh, get very reliable estimates of the key points that you're interested in. And so this can be used and is used now in, in many, many circumstances. So this is very uh, nice that uh, you can actually even transfer to new tasks where uh, the model features haven't been trained on, suggesting that these features in uh, deep neural networks trained on ImageNet are learning something about the visual world that generalizes beyond the particular task of ImageNet. However, uh, we have to be aware that the type of features that are learned are still very different from what humans learn. And um, so it's one should be aware that one shouldn't equate it with object recognition. And so one very nice uh, paper by Alexander Madri showed, for instance, that if you train a neural network with adversarial examples, the features that the network learn generalize also to uh, images that are not adversarial examples, so that are normal images and uh, achieve good test accuracy by training on these adversarial examples. So meaning that the uh, features that are used to um, to classify adversary examples are actually uh, part of nature images and can be used for the classification, but they are very different from what humans perceive in these images. And so the um, overarching question underlying a lot of what we are doing in my lab is 
to ask how can we teach machines to do what we actually want them to do. And if you think of learning as a search problem where you have set up a, a space of all possible decision rules, there's an intended solution in computer vision. This is often very similar to finding like perceptually similar decision making. And the first thing that you do is that you try to achieve a small training error. And in addition, by doing cross validation, you also want to have a small test error. And this reduces the set of possible decision rules quite strongly, but it doesn't mean that you, um, that all decision rules that have the same small test error are actually equal to the intended solution. And so we, there are many, many examples for this. Uh, adversary examples obviously are a very striking uh, difference between human perception and machine perception, but also um, there are examples with domain shifts that uh, when noise, uh, noise sensitivity for images, uh, for machines is often much stronger and different from humans. Um, hum machines tend to look more at texture than at uh, shape or uh, are very sensitive to, to background information, more sensitive to background information, and so on. So I, I will uh, focus here on zwei, two um, examples. So um, when about five years ago, when we developed a synth uh, texture synthesis algorithm, we feeded the neural network with a texturized versions of of an image and figured that the typical convolutional neural networks show almost the same logits to the different class labels as for the original image, which motivated us later to make this um, hypothesis that the neural networks are mostly looking at texture more precise by using a constraint architecture such that the highest layers are still looking only at very small patches and the classification is done only by summing over all the classifications of these individual patches. So it's basically a back of feature architecture, which um, you can think of, you, you decompose your image into all the image patches that it contains. For each image patch, you make a classification and you average over these classifications in order to obtain the final uh, decision. And uh, with this architecture, you can actually achieve quite good performance already with um, a patch size of 32 by 32 image patches. And that means since the, it, the summing over the different classifiers doesn't depend on the ordering of the patches, that the, yeah, the information that you are actually using is only the texture information and not uh, the configuration of, of these different patches. And it also allows you to look at those patches that are most decisive for the decision so that have the strongest impact on the classifier. And so for, uh, and often this makes sense, so it shows very, um, crucial features or very uh, special features of, of the different classes. But sometimes also like for the Tench class here, uh, it's, it's rather the fingers of the proud fisher than the, the fish itself that is uh, most informative or most decisive for the Tench class. And another work that uh, shows this difference between humans and machines in the classification um, is uh, using uh, a style transfer mechanism in order to introduce Q conflicts in the images. So we basically combined texture information of say an elephant texture here and uh, the shape information of a cat. And um, so, and then you can ask whether the classifier rather relies on the shape information or on the texture information. And in order to make this also more feasible for humans, this decision uh, 
what happened. Hello, I think I dropped out. Can you stay? Can you hear me again? Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, could you share your screen again? Sure. So that. Right. Um, yeah. How long did I have been cutting out? So did you see that slide before? Uh, I guess uh, we, we see the uh, top, top, top part of the slides, then you are kind of cut. Okay. And, um, go on. So it turns out that um, humans classify these Q conflict images uh, almost always based on the shape information. So this diagram, basically, if the dot is on the left hand side, it means that the decision that the humans made was rather uh, using the, the shape Q. And if it's on the right hand side, then it's using the texture Q. And the different dots uh, correspond to the diff 16 different classes. And if you look at um, architectures like AlexNet, GoogleNet, VGG16, they are all uh, biased towards using sh uh, the texture information. And uh, so that means even though uh, you achieve high performance on, on the test set. The solution that is used for this decision making is quite different from the decision making rule that humans are using. So, to further constrain the possible solutions, one can apply also out of domain testing. And um, so, again, uh, a nice demonstration for this difference is if you impose additive noise to, during training and uh, say you use um, white Gaussian noise and you test on white Gaussian, Gaussian noise, then you get superhuman performance and uh, same with salt and pepper noise. But when you change uh, during test time, the, the type of noise, even though it looks perceptually quite similar for humans, it can uh, complete, completely deteriorate your, the performance of the classifier. And uh, so we again made a psychophysical experiment with humans testing the noise robustness as a function of the uh, noise variance and compared that to, to these uh, classical architectures that haven't been trained with noise. And you can see that they um, are much less robust. And then we went on and uh, trained the classifiers with all kinds of different noise and um, tested whether the, how well the training with one type of noise generalized to a, to a different type of noise. And there it turned out that this uh, generalization didn't work so well in the beginning. And um, so as, since this noise can be seen also as a domain shift that changes the style of the image, we thought maybe um, we can use um, the style transfer method to, to introduce very different um, appearances of the image by preserving the content. So as you can do with this method, where the same scene can have very different styles. And so we generated a new data set of ImageNet where all the images were transformed into different styles and uh, used this as a data augmentation approach in order to make the classifier invariant against these style changes. And um, by doing that, 
um, it turned out that one can still achieve very high performance on ImageNet. And um, we can then test the performance um, also of the BACnet, for instance, that I, I've been introducing earlier. And there you can see that the performance drops much faster than um, on the clean ImageNet data set. So for this stylized ImageNet, it's not possible to classify the images based on the texture anymore, but you really have to use the shape information in the images. And interestingly, also the, um, the invariance against these different styles makes the neural network much more biased towards shape. So if you look at this um, diagram that I showed you earlier, what type of cues the network is using, if you present Q conflict images, then it's much more biased now towards shape than to texture. And if you uh, apply uniform additive noise, so which that you haven't used during training, the decay of performance looks much more similar to that of humans. So this is this yellow brownish curve. Okay, so one idea to um, get closer to the intended solutions is that you one applies more and more out of domain testing. And in this way, maybe at some point arrive at the intended solution. But um, a very hard test, probably the hardest test is to use counterfactual testing. And so by making neural networks robust against uh, adversarial attacks, um, yeah, we, we would be would uh, this would be a very hard test to um, have a similar decision rule as for humans, and for very simple data sets like MNIST, um, using generative models actually yields or can yield um, adversarial examples that look quite interpretable to humans. So we designed a analysis by synthesis model where for the 10 different classes, the um, classification is based on, you could say 10 different experts that try to explain the current image by generating an image that is as similar as possible to the presented image. And then the expert with the highest likelihood is chosen as the, um, as the correct class label. And when you apply a gradient de descent to find like the, the next, the closest um, different label, I show you some images here on the right hand side where uh, the images that you see are exactly at the decision boundary. So for the first image, you see it's um, an example the probability that this is classified as a zero or as a six is exactly 50%. For the next example, it's between one and two, then between two and seven, three and seven, and four and nine. And so this is actually looks quite similar to uh, also what how a human would be uncertain about the classification of these images. And uh, this um, Property has been analyzed in a very recent paper uh, much more precisely by using so-called controversial stimuli. So what you do there is that you can compare two models, A and B, as is shown in, on the left-hand side, so the response of two models to different stimuli, and you can search for stimuli that exhibit the strongest disagreement, for instance, in, in this diagram. So the x-axis would show like the probability for a seven given the image minus the probability for a, draw, a three given a, the image and uh, for both models and on the uh, red di diagonal you see that's basically the, the diagonal where you have the strong disagreement and the far out you are the more controversial these stimuli are. Now you can test in a pairwise fashion, 
or you can search for each pair of images for uh, images that are most controversial between these two images. And what you see then is that for the for our model, the controversial images actually, um, or that humans actually agree with our model that these are the sevens rather than threes. And here, on the other hand, when these um, are threes rather than sevens. So as a last um, example, I want to mention a work on invariance testing. So in, in addition to adversarial examples, which basically are examples where minimal changes uh, in the images lead to different machi machine perception, but keep the human perception constant. In metameric examples, you have um, humans perceiving very different things while the machine uh, sees the same. And with invertible neural networks, you can easily generate pre-images where the, um, the logits the output that you are using for the classification are completely identical, but you just uh, change the, the remaining nuisance uh, parameters. And you can see that even though all these images that uh, are generated with exactly the same um, outputs look very, very different to humans. And so in, usually when we don't use invertible architectures, um, we throw away a lot of information and that's this information that we throw away actually corresponds to the type of invariances that the network is using also to generalize. And um, so in an, in an invertible neural network, we have this using space that is typically thrown away. We make this invariance manifold explicit such that we can uh, explore it. And so the examples that I showed you um, can be seen like this. So for instance, for ImageNet, we have a, a bit more than 150,000 input dimensions and thus also 150,000 output dimensions. And only 1,000 of them are used for the classification and 150,000 are then the nuisance space, the invariance manifold. And for MNIST, we have something like 784 dimensions, 10 are used for the MNIST classes and uh, 774 again spend the using space. And so the way how to generate these images, these pre-images is by combining, say the uh, thousand dimensions of the signal image shown on the left-hand side with the 150,000 dimensions of the using space on the, shown on the right-hand side. And uh, as you can see, the pre-images look more or less exactly the same as the, um, the images from which you took the nuisance information. And the same is true for the MNIST images. So uh, that shows the a big difference between human decision-making and, and machine decision-making. But now, as we made this uh, nuisance space ex explicit, we can ex try to minimize the mutual information between the nuisance space and the labels. And by doing that, um, we can significantly change the behavior of the neural network. So here you can see, again, examples on the lower row showing the nuisance images and at the top row the signal images. And for a standard learning paradigm, the pre-images would look like the nuisance images. But if you minimize the mutual information between the nuisance space and the labels, then uh, the pre-images start looking like the um, like the signal images. So basically, the signal space captures now the perceptually relevant information. OK, that uh, brings me to the end of my talk. So I've been mentioning a couple of attempts to show basically how 
the standard learning paradigm of minimizing uh, test accuracy uh, gives still leaves room for lots of different decision making rules that achieve high performance on the test set, but yet um, very, allow for very different strategies to solve that problem. And the question is how, what kind of um, tests allow us to come up with a more constraining solutions such that the resulting neural networks rather match the, um, the decision-making behavior of humans or of our intended solutions. And I think uh, the, the goal would be to introduce better inductive biases in order to make this uh, more effective. Thanks for your attention. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Professor Martis, for your great talk. And uh, can you end your screen share now? Yes, just a second. Uh.